My name is Case Robinson and I'm 26 years old and I've successfully built two homes as an owner builder and right now I'm planning my third home build. I've created this video to be the most in-depth video on YouTube that will actually teach you how to build your own house. I'm going to be covering everything from obtaining an owner builder loan and getting the financing you need to actually designing the house to finding and hiring the subcontractors and suppliers that you'll need to actually building the house and managing the job site and then all the way to the final blue tape walkthrough and final inspection of your completed home build. If you're actually interested in building your house then you should click the link down below and check out my digital course where I teach you everything you need to know to actually take on your first home build as well as I provide 10 PDFs and downloadable Excel sheets that will assist you throughout your first home build. So with that said, let's get into the video. So the very first step in this building your own house process is figuring out what I like to refer to as the initial idea. And if you're watching this video, then you probably already have this initial idea up here in your head. And that is likely one of the three options that I'm about to list. Either you are thinking that you want to build a house to rent, or you're thinking that you want to build a house to sell, or lastly, and probably most popular, you're thinking that you want to build a house to occupy and live in for your primary residence. Building a house to rent could be building a single family property to keep as a rental property, long-term real estate investment, or secondly, you might be thinking of building a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex, or maybe even a small scale apartment complex, or maybe even a big scale apartment complex to keep as a long-term real estate investment property. And then lastly, building a house to occupy and live in for your primary residence is obvious. You know, maybe you're thinking you wanna build a slightly larger house than what you live in right now with a pool. That way you could live there for, you know, five to 15 years and have your family grow into that house. Or maybe you're like, hey, I have all that money in the world. I have an unlimited budget and I'm ready to retire and build my you know, custom dream home on 200 acres and wherever that may be. So those are likely the three options for your initial idea. And that is the very first step to the building your own house process. Just determining what that initial idea is. Are you going to build a house to rent, to sell, or to live in as your primary residence? The second step in the building your own house process is determining your preliminary budget for the project. And this kind of depends on what financing option you decide to go with on your home build. And for the most part, there are two main financing options. The first one being cash and your own personal resources. And then the second one would be a construction loan of some sort. Cash and your own personal resources could be considered a number of things. One and most importantly is cash that you have in the bank, whether that be in a checking account or a savings account. The second option may be a credit card of some sort that you think you can utilize on the home build. Third option might be just like liquidating some stocks or something that you're invested into elsewhere. Maybe you have a really good friend or family member who's willing to give you money to go out and build your house. Not that I know a friend that would give me money to go build my own house, but hey, uh, cash and your own personal resources is essentially whatever you have directly available to you without getting a construction loan, right? So I actually built my first two houses using cash and credit cards. So I've never got a construction loan, but I will as of right now, I'm getting one for my next home build. Determining your budget if you're building with cash and your own personal resources is simply a matter of calculating how much you have and then calculating how much you're willing to take from that and invest into your home build, whether that be you're building to rent or sell or keep as your primary residence, right? So that's how you determine your preliminary budget if you're gonna finance the home build with cash. Now, secondly, if you're considering to build a house to rent or to sell and you're interested in getting a construction loan, then you can probably pretty easily obtain a commercial loan to build that house to rent or sell. You will notice that building a house to rent or sell both have in common that you're building that project to make money in an attempt to make money. And that's why commercial loans exist. So if you go in and meet with a commercial lender, they give you commercial loans, not based on your income situation, Instead, they evaluate the project itself and they evaluate the deal. And if you're building a fourplex, they evaluate all the numbers, they crunch the numbers on the deal and they say, okay, this looks like a good investment. We will give you a commercial loan you know, to fund your deal, right? So if you're looking to build a house to rent or to sell, then you can probably pretty easily get a commercial loan, but maybe we'll talk about that in another video because I'm sure most of you people watching this video are interested in building your own house to occupy and live in as your primary residence. And the most common type of loan that you will be able to get 
if especially if you are considering building your own house as your own general contractor as an owner builder will be what's called an owner builder loan that is a construction to permanent loan with a one-time close. There are three main qualifications when it comes to an owner builder loan. Of course, these qualifications are going to vary from lender to lender, but with the lender that I'm working with currently on getting my owner builder loan for the house that I'm about to build, there are three main qualifications and they are a minimum of a 675 credit score. Secondly, they approve a 45% debt to income ratio. And then lastly, they require a 15% down payment. So the first one being credit score, that's a really easy one to check. You got to have a minimum of 675. If you do not monitor your credit as of right now, then I highly recommend you doing so you know what are you doing with your life if you're not checking your credit there are several free apps that you can download on your handy dandy iphone or whatever phone you may have and the most popular ones are experian and credit karma you can monitor your credit also through your banking app i'm sure if you have something like chase bank or capital one anyways here is credit karma credit karma shows my credit score to be right there 753 and 738 and then on experian my credit score shows to be 771. Yeah, my credit score is not the best, to be honest with you, because my credit takes an absolute beating because I apply for some kind of new credit. Seems like every two to three months, I'm either buying a new truck or applying for a new mortgage or getting a new credit card or something because credit is very important and credit allows me to do the things that I'm doing. So with that said, that is the credit score qualification, a minimum of 675 credit score. So the second qualification that a bank is going to require you to have in order to get approved to obtain an owner builder loan is having enough money in the bank to pay the down payment for the loan. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple easy to understand examples. So you can figure out how the down payment is calculated and how it works. Here we have a total project cost of $250,000 dollars fairly cheap project and if you look we have two lines one goes to the down payment which you are responsible for paying and then on the right we have the LTC which stands for loan to cost so this is going to be the loan amount you'll figure out whenever you start exploring lenders and calling around calling banks calling different lenders you can ask them what is the loan to cost amount that you guys allow do you allow a 90 percent loan to cost with a 10 percent down payment or do you offer a 80% loan to cost? Well, then of course, if you have an 80% loan to cost, then they would require a 20% down payment. Here in this example, well, specifically with the bank that I'm working with as of right now to get my owner builder loan, they require a 15% down payment. So for these examples, we're going to use a 15% down payment. So 15% of $250,000 is a $37,500 down payment. And then they offer a 85% loan to cost which means they would lend me $212,500 for this project. Moving on. Next project, total project cost $500,000. With a 15% down payment, I would have to pay a $75,000 down payment and then 85% loan to cost. They would give a $425,000 loan. Moving on, total project cost. Say I want to build a house and the total project cost is going to be a million dollars. They would require a 15% down payment, which is going to be $150,000. And then boom, over here, 85% loan to cost, they would lend $850,000. And I'm not going to go any higher than that because whenever numbers start getting super high, there's sometimes some requirements and restrictions once loans get above a certain amount. So we'll stop there. Hopefully that helps you understand how down payments work. And there is a down payment requirement. So you are going to have enough money in the bank to be able to afford to make the down payment on the loan. And the last qualification that the bank is going to look at to see if you are approved for an owner builder loan has a little bit to do with what's called DTI, which stands for debt to income, debt to income ratio specifically. So basically this is where the bank is going to evaluate your income situation and they're going to evaluate your debt situation and they're going to do the math to calculate the maximum monthly mortgage payment that you can afford based on the finished house that you want to build, right? It does get a little bit confusing, but I have it laid out into a very easy to understand real life example. So before I get into this real life example, just let me say that I'm not a banker, I'm not a loan officer, I'm not a licensed professional blender, whatever you wanna call it. Don't judge me on my terminology and whatever, but I'm going to explain it and hopefully it's fairly easy to understand, okay? So this is our real life example where we have a, let's pretend it's a, a single man who lives alone and he wants to apply for an owner builder loan. 
and see if he can get approved. Well, this fella makes $240,000 in annual income. So he makes $240,000 a year. Pretty good. So this is equal to $20,000 per month. $240,000 per year divided by 12 gives you $20,000 per month. Next is lenders approve you for up to 45% debt to income ratio. Of course, every lender is different. Some will only approve 40%, some will approve like 48%, and then others are all kind of in between. But the lender that I'm working with will approve you for up to 45% debt to income ratio. So basically what you do is you find out the amount that they will approve you up to based on your debt to income, and you multiply that percentage times your monthly income. So 45% times 20,000 is $9,000. That is the maximum monthly payment that you can afford per month if you don't have any other debt. Well, let's say that this guy has $4,000 in monthly debt. Whenever he submits his application, they pull his credit, they're gonna see that he owes credit card payments and a car payment for a total of $4,000. You know, we can pretend that this guy currently lives in a house that he owns, but He's going intend, to, he intends on selling the house once his house that he wants to build is finished. So the bank is not going to count that debt of the house he lives in for his current mortgage payment. So that's wiped out. So let's pretend he has a $4,000 monthly debt, which is a combination of just credit cards and a car payment. So now we subtract the $9,000 minus his $4,000 in monthly debt. That gives us a $5,000 monthly mortgage payment that he is approved for on that construction loan, okay? So now that we know the $5,000 monthly mortgage payment amount that he's approved for, we can use that to find out the total project cost that he would be approved for, as well as the down payment that he would be responsible for on his construction loan. So now I'm gonna go to this website right here, which is just mortgagecalculator.org, and it's a website that we're gonna use to figure out the total project cost that he can afford, as well as his down payment. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in these numbers on the left in this section, and we're gonna try to make them match $5,000 because that's the total monthly payment that he can afford. And then also we will see how much his down payment will be, okay? So we'll leave this at $400,000. The bank that I'm working with requires a 15% down payment. So we'll put 15% in right there. Next, we know that interest rates are sitting at like seven or 8% right now. So we'll just submit 8% interest for right now. Um, of course, interest rates go up and down depending on the market. We will do a 30-year mortgage because the bank that I'm working with offers a 30-year mortgage and I'm sure others do too. For property tax, $10,000 a year. You know, property tax rates are different location to locations, but around here, they're somewhere around 2%. So let's just say $10,000. PMI is mortgage insurance. The bank that I'm working with does not require mortgage insurance or they don't make you pay mortgage insurance. So we'll put zero there. And then homeowner's insurance, we'll do $2,400 because I feel like that's a safe amount for roughly a $400,000 house, okay? So now I'm gonna hit calculate. And in this deal right here, to build a total project cost home value, this is where the total project cost value is. So for hit this guy to build a $400,000 house with a 15% down payment, his monthly mortgage payment is gonna be $3,500. Well, we know he can afford a $5,000 uh, monthly payment. So we're gonna bump up the total project cost from 400,000. Let's do $575,000. $575,000 total project cost, hit calculate, and this guy, his monthly payment on a $575,000 total project cost house would be $4,619. So now we know we, he can go up a little bit higher than that. So let's try $650,000. Here we are, we're very close. This is just a preliminary budget, so we don't need it to be down to the penny. But essentially, we have met the $5,000 per month mortgage payment, roughly $5,000. This means this guy in the real life example would be able to build a total project cost of $650,000. That's how much he would get approved for with a bank, $650,000 that he could use to buy a piece of land and build a house. And then also with a 15% down payment, he would be responsible for paying $97,500 as a down payment, okay? So determining your preliminary budget just simply allows you to evaluate your own financials. And also it allows you to see if you can afford the monthly payments that come along with taking on that construction loan and building that house, as well as it allows you to evaluate to see if you can afford to actually make the down payment that is required to take on that loan. In order to avoid wasting your own time and the bank's time, you can do these calculations on your own and get a very rough estimate of the total project that you can afford along with the monthly payments and the down payment that would be required. Or 
If this seems like too much for you, then it's very easy to simply pick up the phone and call around, find a lender to submit an application with where you will submit all your personal information. They'll pull your credit, evaluate your DTI, and they will tell you the total project cost along with the monthly payments that you would be approved for on your owner builder loan. So if you're using your own cash and personal resources as your financing option to build your project, then this next explanation doesn't necessarily pertain to you. But if you're considering a construction loan of any sort, then it most certainly does. So after you've done your own calculations and homework to make sure you have a high enough credit score, your own DTI calculations to see the maximum monthly mortgage payment you can afford in return will tell you how much total project cost you can afford and also what your down payment will be. Once you've done your own calculations, and you evaluate the situation and you say, hey, this is a project that I want to move forward with, then of course it's time to reach out to lenders, start calling around and find a lender that you want to work with. And once you've done that, they will send you an email with a clickable link where you will just open your email, click the link, it'll open you to a portal where you can apply for the loan. This is where you'll put in your personal information, the loan information that you are looking to obtain, and also all of the documents that they will need to evaluate your income situation. So if you're self-employed, then you will likely be providing self-employed tax returns, K-1s, W-2s, and any other of that jazz. And if you're an employee, then you'll be likely providing W-2s, pay stubs, your tax returns, of course. And then regardless, if you're self-employed or an employee, you will also be providing bank statements to show how much money you have in the bank. And then also you will be signing a form, allowing them to pull your credit to evaluate your debt situation. So after you apply, they will take a couple hours and then they will give you their decision on if you are approved or if you are denied. And most importantly, they will tell you how much you are approved for if you are approved. So here are the main three reasons that you need to get approved. Some people believe that they don't need to be approved and it's ridiculous. They will go out and shop for land without even knowing that they are approved to purchase that piece of land. The first reason that you need to get pre-approved is for just a peace of mind that you are in fact able to get the financing needed to follow through with that purchase of that piece of real estate. So for number one, peace of mind. The second reason is it determines a very accurate preliminary budget. When you do your uh, original calculations, you know, you may come up with some one number, but whenever you apply for the bank, they may say, hey, you're not approved for a $1.5 million loan, you're approved for a $1 million loan. So it will determine a accurate preliminary budget. And then thirdly, it allows you to submit serious competitive offers to the sellers of a piece of real estate. Whenever a seller has a piece of land listed for sale on the market, they may be getting a, getting a bunch of offers, right? And they have to evaluate which offer to go with. Well, if Joe Blow offers on that, piece of land, he just says, hey, I want to buy it for $100,000, right? He doesn't submit anything else but a verbal offer. And then you come in and you say, hey, I want to buy your piece of land for $95,000. Here's my pre-approval letter with the bank. You know, I would like to put X amount down on this piece of property. These are the terms of my offer and it is a very formal written offer by email. And it also it contains that pre-approval letter with the bank then the seller, he's going to have to evaluate those offers. Is he going to accept Joe Blow's verbal offer with no other you know, supporting documentation? Or is he going to accept your offer that has a written pre-approval from a bank to show that you are indeed a qualified buyer? So those are the three reasons that you need to get pre-approved. It's very important to get pre-approved prior to going out and searching for your land. But once you have your pre-approval letter in hand from your bank, it is now time to hire your realtor and shop for land listed for sale on the MLS. A realtor or a real estate agent is a licensed professional who will represent you throughout the transaction of a sale or of a purchase of a piece of real estate. You know, buying a piece of land is not as simple as just verbally agreeing on a price with the seller and then handing them a lot of cash and they hand you the keys and then you go your separate ways and call it good. It's not that simple. Instead, it is a rather complex process that takes 20 to 45 days to navigate through and typically includes several different parties. Maybe it includes the buyer and the seller, the buyer's agent, the seller's agent, a lender and a title company, and sometimes several other third party services. So with that said, you should most definitely hire a realtor. And I'm not saying hire any realtor because probably 98 or 95 to 98% of realtors out there are not very good at what they do because there's such 
a low barrier of entry into that profession, but you should do your best to find and hire a good realtor because they are very helpful throughout the transaction process. And there's two main reasons you should hire one. For one, hiring a real estate agent as a buyer is free to you as the buyer because whenever you go through the transaction, the seller is the one who pays for both his real estate agent and also he pays the fee for the buyer's real estate agent. So as a buyer, you should hire a real estate agent for sure because it is free to you as the buyer. The second reason is because they are a professional. You know, it is their, their profession. They go through and handle real estate sale transactions on a daily basis, and they are very familiar with the processes that are involved with that transaction, as well as they are familiar with the terminology, and also they are familiar with all the paperwork and contracts that take place whenever the sale of a piece of real estate happens, because if you've never purchased a piece of real estate, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and the realtor you know, it's their profession. They're very, very familiar with all that paperwork. So you should hire a real estate agent because they are free as a buyer. And secondly, because they're professional at what they do. And you are likely not a professional at purchasing or selling a piece of real estate. In this instance, purchasing a piece of land. So once you hire a realtor, you need to sit down with them in person and have a very thorough conversation to go over everything that you're looking for in your piece of land. You're going to have to answer questions like, what is the budgeted price range for that piece of land? Are you searching for a piece of land that is going to cost $100,000 to $150,000 or $300,000 to $500,000? What cities or certain part of a city do you want to purchase your piece of land in? What school district do you want to purchase your piece of land in? Maybe you have kids and it's important for you to know exactly what school district your piece of land needs to be purchased in. That way your kids can attend a certain school. What amenities do you want to live by? Do you want to live by gyms or fast food restaurants or movie theaters or maybe very close to a grocery store because you go to the grocery store daily? Do you want to live in an area with a high crime rate or with a low crime rate? I would assume you want to purchase a piece of land in a low crime rate area. You want to make sure to avoid annoying disturbances like purchasing a lot right next to an airport where airplanes are taking off over your house daily going right over your house while you're trying to sleep or while you're trying to work if you work from home. You want to avoid purchasing a piece of land that is right by a train track that has trains coming all day and all night blowing their horn. Or maybe you for sure want to avoid purchasing a piece of land right by a gun range where they are shooting gunshots from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or maybe if it's important to you to purchase one right by a gun range because you like shooting guns and that's something important for your realtor to know as well. So after you have that conversation with your realtor, it is finally time to shop for land and your realtor will take the criteria that you provided to them and they will input it into their system and it will populate all the lots based on your criteria and they will send you the available lots listed for sale based on your criteria of everything that's important for you as well as while your realtor does her shopping for your lot you can also take the reins and do your own shopping for your own lot using just free websites that are online and the names of those websites are Har or Redfin or my personal favorite is Zillow.com. So you can go to Zillow.com and go up here in the top left corner and click buy. Now you can enter the city that you want to purchase your piece of land in. Let's say you want to purchase it in Austin, Texas. And now we're going to select the price range. Maybe you have a budget of 300000 to 450,000. Now we're gonna go to home type and we're going to deselect all and we're going to select lots and land. We're gonna click apply. And then as you see here, it has a boundary around Austin and it is showing you all the available lots that are listed for sale from 300 to 450,000. These are all pieces of land listed for sale in Austin. So you can click on some of these, go through them in order. You can click on this area on the left to check out that piece of land and the details you see here, this is a $330,000 lot. Here's the address, 6,534 square feet. It's a pretty small lot. Incredible opportunity to build the dream home or investment property, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that's not your favorite, so you'll keep searching. You can use this area over here on the right. Click this one. This is 370,000, 9,000 square feet. It has pictures of the lot right here where you can see all the photos. Sought after East Austin location, less than five miles to the heart of downtown Austin. So that is how you can search for your own land using Zillow.com. Another decently effective method for finding land for sale is just simply getting in your vehicle and driving around the areas that you want to purchase in and looking for for sale signs that are placed in the front of that piece of property. Sometimes people want to sell a piece of land, but they're not under any pressure and they don't want to go through the hassle of finding and hiring a real estate agent to get them to list that property for sale on the MLS where that listing will populate on these public websites. Instead, they just stick this sign in the front of their property 
and wait for someone to call. And if they get a call and they get some bites, they will consider offers on selling that piece of property. So that's another effective method that you can use to search for land. So whenever you finally find the right piece of land and you have completed all of your due diligence that you need to do, and you are certain that this is the piece of land you wanna purchase, it's time to consult with your real estate agent to come up with your best offer that you can submit to the sellers along with your pre-approval letter showing that you are qualified for the loan that is needed to purchase the land and build your house on that piece of land. One important thing to include in your offer is to include a 60 day extended closing period. Most real estate transactions come with a 30 day closing period, but specifically on this transaction if you are using an owner builder loan or any other construction type loan it's important to include a extended closing period of somewhere around 60 days because that will allow you as the builder to provide the building plans the final build budget and also the spec sheet showing what kind of material will be used on the home build all those documents to the bank because the bank will need those prior to being able to close on the loan so once you're finally under contract on the land with the seller and you have both signed the dotted line it is time to hire your architect and your engineer so they can start the design of your home for that piece of land. So after you go through the process of finding and hiring your architect and engineer, you will then meet with your architect to of course introduce yourselves and make sure y'all are a good fit. And whenever you proceed, you will then meet with him and go over the style of house that you want to build. Do you want to build a super modern style house or a Spanish style house or a craftsman style house or a modern farmhouse style house or a ranch style house or a beach or coastal style house if you're gonna be building along the beach? Then once you explain the style of house that you wanna build and show them some photos of similar style houses that you may have found online or something like that for an inspiration, then you will provide him with a detailed list of important items that you would like to be included in the design of the house and of the floor plan and of the whole site plan. So do you want a port cache so you can park your house under the port cache? Do you want a dog wash station located somewhere inside the house or on the exterior? Do you want an elevator in your house? Do you want a movie theater room? Do you want a indoor bowling alley? Do you want a designated man cave room? Do you want a real wood burning indoor fireplace? Do you want an outdoor tennis court? Do you want an indoor basketball court? Do you want a regular closed wood frame staircase or do you want a open steel framed modern style staircase? And the more realistic items would be like how big do you want your home in terms of square footage? What are your individual room size preferences? How many bedrooms and bathrooms do you want? Do you want a two car garage or a three car garage or a four car garage? Do you want a two story house or a one story house? So you get the point there. After you get on the same page with your architect on the style of the house that you want to build and then also all the important items that you would like included in the design, he will then start to design your house and work on the blueprints to bring all of your ideas to a reality on a paper blueprint form. So the architect will design the architectural aspects of the house, which are the floor plan. And the floor plan is just the layout of the whole house, you know, where all the rooms are gonna sit, where's the kitchen gonna go, where's the living room gonna go. He will also design the elevations and elevations are referred to as what the exterior of your house will look like from the front, from the right, from the left, and from the back. The architect will also design the pool. If you're gonna have a pool on your house, he will also design the site plan to show where your house will sit on the lot you know will it sit in the middle of the lot will it sit on the right will it sit on the left will it sit in the back will it sit in the front and then of course he can design a number of things there after that like maybe if you want a specific style of landscape and that requires a landscape design then the architect can do those kind of designs as well so the the possibilities are endless you know if you want to build this big custom dream home uh, with all these different custom touches then of course the architect is going to be very involved but if it's a more simple house then he may just have to design the floor plan the elevations the site plan and that would be it the engineer will design the structural aspects of the home build which the structural aspects are at the very least the foundation plan and also the framing plan. The engineer can also get involved on designing other plans like maybe the HVAC plan to make sure that HVAC system that gets installed on your home is efficient as possible and it's the right size and all the right poundage and loads and all that. I'm not gonna get into that because I'm not an engineer. But at the very minimum, the engineer will design the framing plan and the foundation plan, which are the structural aspects of the home build and the design. So the architect and the engineer 
engineer will do their thing. They'll design the house. Of course, you'll go back and forth making revisions, but once it's all said and done, they will provide you with a set of building plans. And that set of building plans is what you, the owner builder, will use to turn your piece of empty raw land into your finished home build. If it is a very simple house, then this process can be very quick and smooth with the assistance of a good architect, and they can throw some plans together in just a matter of probably a couple days or at the very most, you know, two or three weeks, depending on their schedule, of course. But if this is a semi-custom spec house that you're going to be building with some custom touches to try to really sell fast and make, you know, a six-figure profit on or something like that, then that semi-custom spec house will need a little more attention to detail throughout the design process, so it might take a little bit longer. And then, of course, if this is going to be a super custom mansion house with a very complicated landscape design on the front of the house and then a super custom house itself with a you know a 12 car garage and then a really custom backyard with a really big pool with a, a lazy river around it and then more landscape designs in the back with an outdoor living area with a pergola you know all that kind of house if the project is on that scale then of course this process of designing the house and going back and forth with the architect and the engineer could take several months because that architect would have to design pretty much every square inch of the whole property and I'm not talking about just the house he would have to design every square inch of the whole property itself the whole piece of land everything from the front landscape to the house to the garage to the backyard to the pool to the outdoor living and so on so while you are still under contract on your land and while your house is also in the design process you should be taking the time to find all of your material suppliers and all of your subcontractors who will assist you in providing the material and also building the house Finding all the subcontractors that you are going to hire on your very first home build as an owner builder can seem like almost an impossible task and I completely understand because just a couple months ago before I started my very first home build, I was in the same place as you and I had that very intimidating and overwhelming feeling hit me where I would ask myself a question, how am I really going to find 20 to 30 reliable and trustworthy and fair priced subcontractors to go to work for me and help me build my very first house. But trust me, this is a relatively simple and easy to accomplish task that just takes a little bit of courage and a little bit of communication. I've already made a video showing exactly how I found all my subcontractors on my first home build and I've posted that video on YouTube. So you can go check out that video if you wanna watch the whole thing. But let's roll a clip from that video. Tu és o jefe? Onde? El jefe? Donde? Tu? Que tipo de trabajo haces usted? Solo roofing. Solo teja. Sí, solo plego de teja. Okay, ¿cómo se llama? As you can see, I actually recorded myself going out and finding all the subcontractors that I used to help me successfully complete my very first home build as an owner builder. In summary, my strategy was just to go out to existing job sites where homes were getting built and have conversations with the subcontractors that were working there on site. You know, I would introduce myself, they would introduce themselves, I would ask them what kind of work do you do, how long have you been doing it, and we would have just a very brief conversation, and if I I felt like the conversation went good and they could possibly be a good fit to work for me on my project, then I would ask for their contact information and notate it down so I would have it whenever I needed it. So overall, not too challenging, just takes a little bit of courage and communication. But of course, there is a lot more to the strategy than what I just summarized. And I include all the other information you need to know to tell you how to find the best quality subcontractors for the absolute best labor rates in your area in my How to Build Your Own House course. You can find several building material supplier options by going on Google and Googling material supplier near me. And then I like to go over here to the maps page. That's just my personal preference. And then as it pulls it up, of course, here on the left, you have all several options, but I'll go over the larger and more common building materials. So to start, we got the famous Home Depot and also Lowe's. They get a lot of hate from the real home builders, but to be honest, they have competitive rates and they sell the exact same material. So Home Depot, Lowe's, right here we have Builders First Source. This is a very popular home building company that specializes in a turnkey service of providing every single piece of material that you could possibly need in building your home. And then a little bit different from them, right here we have 84 Lumber. 84 Lumber, of course, given their name, specializes in supplying lumber, but they also sell some other things like windows and whatnot. Right here we have McCoy's Building Supply. They're probably a nationwide 
home building supply company, and they specialize in the turnkey service of providing all kinds of material. And then two more I'll show you is down here in this area of Houston. And actually, that's Beacon Building Products. They're one. But this one, more importantly, is ABC Supply. And they sell roofing material, gutter material, siding material, and exterior doors. But they specialize in supplying roofing material. And if you want to explore some other options, then you can reach out to the local, smaller lumber yards in your area. And they will also likely be able to supply most of the material that you need to build your house. As you find all your suppliers and all your subcontractors, you can fill out your supplier list Excel sheet and also the subcontractor list Excel sheet that I provide in my course so you can keep all your contacts organized. You should be searching for a minimum of five material suppliers and also a minimum of three to five subcontractors for every single trade. That way you have multiple options when it comes down to the time where you need to decide who to hire for your home build. So after the architect and engineer finalize your building blueprints or building plans, same thing, they're going to submit them to you by email in a PDF form where then you can take that email and submit it to a graphics place and they can print them out on the you know large print paper that you see building plans on that are typically like a foot and a half tall by two foot wide. Okay, so this is what a set of finished building plans actually looks like. This is page one and you can see it has the front elevation and then also the rear elevation. Elevations just show you what the house looks like from the front and the back and then the right and the left. So here's the front elevation, looks good from the front, looks good on good from the back. Then next page is the first floor plan. Um, this is the bottom floor, this is a two story house. So the first floor plan just shows the layout of the house. So as you can see, the garage is right here. You come in through this door and it has under stair storage here. Then right here has dining room and it has the kitchen family room. Going over here has the powder bathroom. Going over here has the utility room. Then going up the stairs. Let's see what goes up the stairs. Next page is the second floor plan where you come up the stairs and you go this way into the primary bedroom and then the primary bathroom, primary closet. You go back down this hallway. Here's a little loft area. You go into bedroom number two with the closet and you come this way. Here's a Jack and Jill style bathroom. So a vanity, a shower, a toilet, another vanity, and another bedroom. Here is the right elevation, what the house looks like from the right side. Here's the left elevation, what the house looks like from the left side. Here is the first floor joist and beam plan and the second floor joist and beam plan. So after the framers frame the first floor walls, they will do then move on to the first floor joist and beam plan. This is the floor system that holds up the second story part of the house. Then after they do the second story walls, they will move on to the second floor joist and beam plan that holds up the roof system. Next, we have the actual roof plan that shows how the roof looks and also the pitch of the roof. And then right here is the rafter and purlin plan, also pertaining to the roof plan. Next, we have the first floor suggested electrical plan. So you can see the architect has ran all of the wires and where he suggests all of the outlets go, all of the light switches go, all of the lights. Here's the second floor suggested electrical plan where he has also drawn all that in as well as some ceiling fans. Next page is the foundation footprint. This specifies the perimeter of the actual foundation itself. The foundation contractor will use this to shape the uh, foundation whenever it comes time to complete the foundation. Next is the foundation plan. This page lists where all the footers go, where all the beams go. Right here you can see footers and beams and also it specifies the layout for the concrete rebar. So it says put a four inch concrete slab over number three size rebar. Number three just specifies the size of rebar. This is like number three, here's number four, here's number five. So it says use three number three rebar at 15 inches on center, both ways centered above and chaired, blah, blah, blah. So you can see he's saying it needs to be number three rebar all in here on a 15 inch sitter grid pattern, right? So this foundation plan specifies how the foundation should be built. Next we have the actual site plan. This shows the property lines. You can see here's the property lines for this property from corner to corner, four straight property sides, and it shows the building line. You see this dashed line is the building line. The house has to be built inside of that building line. And it shows the house, of course, built inside the building line, as well as it shows the concrete driveway and it shows the streets. So this is called the site plan page. Next, we have the drainage plan. 
And of course, the drainage plan specifies where the water will drain. So this is usually just a pretty simple plan, but it shows blue arrows showing natural water drainage, natural water drainage. You see right here on the right, it says six inch swell. So he's saying that a six inch swell needs to be dug right here to allow water to drain from this corner up to this ditch right here. So that is a complete set of building plans. The building plans are what the material suppliers are gonna use to calculate how much of what kind of material you need to complete your home build. So for instance, you're gonna send out your building plans to material suppliers and they're gonna review them. And in order to calculate the lumber supply, they're gonna look at your building plans and they're gonna be able to determine how many two by four by eights you need and how many two by four by tens you need. Then they'll move on to two by sixes and they'll move on to two by eights and they'll tell you how many two by tens you need and how many two by twelves you need and so on. There's a lot more than what I just listed, but it'll show them how much of what kind of lumber you need. Then you'll supply them to the roof supply store and they will use your plans to determine how many rolls of underlayment do you need? How many rolls of ice and water shield do you need? How many boxes of plastic cap nails do you need? How many boxes of coil nails do you need? How many pieces of flashing do you need? How many linear feet of drip edge do you need? How many bundles of field shingles do you need? How many bundles of ridge cap shingles do you need? So these building blueprints will allow the suppliers to calculate exactly what quantity of exactly what type of material that you need to complete your home build. And this will allow all the suppliers to put together a full material list for your home build. And they will use that material list to provide you with their most competitive proposal or bid or estimate to supply all the material for your home build. Also, these building blueprints will show all of your subcontractors exactly what kind of work and how much work is needed to complete your home build. So for instance, the building blueprints will show the plumber how many linear feet of pipe is needed for the underground plumbing on your home build. How many linear feet of pipe is needed for the rough end plumbing that goes inside the walls? How many sinks do they have to connect? How many bathtubs do they have to install? How many showers do they have to connect and install? And what size water heater is needed to power all of the hot water for your house. The building plans do the same thing that they do for the plumber as they do for the electrician, the HVAC contractor, the siding contractor, the roofer, and so on. So essentially, the building plans in paper form will show the full scope of work that is needed from every single subcontractor on every single part of your build. So once your building plans are fully complete, it is now time to contact all of the suppliers and all of the subcontractors from the Excel sheet list that you used to organize all their contacts. You should send out a formal email using the bid request template that I provided in my course. And this bid request should include all expectations very clearly so that there's a clear understanding between you, the builder, and all the subcontractors who you hire to help build your house. The subcontractors and all the suppliers will respond back to this email with their most competitive bid or proposal to help you build your house. As you receive these bids in real time, you should organize them all into the supplier list Excel sheet and the subcontractor list Excel sheet. And this will allow you to easily compare bids side by side, apples to apples. And finally, after a couple days, once all of the bids have been received and organized into Excel, you will then select your winner subcontractor for each part of the build. And also you will select your winner material supplier. The final build budget ensures that you are staying on budget for the total project cost that you can afford. And also the bank will need a copy of this final build line itemized budget prior to being able to close on the loan. So as you select your subcontractors and as you select your material suppliers that you wanna work with on your build, you should be transferring each of their accepted bids into the final build budget Excel sheet that I provided my course. And as long as you received a bid on every single trade from a subcontractor and from the material supplier, then this final build budget should be 95 to 98% accurate. You'll see a lot of other builders, they will say how they went 10 to 20 or 30 or 40% over budget. You'll see videos on YouTube. I went 100% over budget. I spent a million dollars more than I was supposed to. Well, that's because they are not organized and did not do a good job budgeting. So with that said, my budget on my last build was $257,000 and my total project cost after everything was said and done was $263,000. So that means my budget was 98.8% accurate. I was only $6,000 over budget. So at this point in the process, you can provide your itemized final budget, a build spec sheet list, 
that lists the specs on every single part of the build and also the final building plans to your bank and this will allow you to close on the purchase of the land and also close on the owner builder loan which all happens simultaneously when you sign the papers at the title company now we're on to the actual build the final step before you get to start the actual build is applying for your building permit with the local building department. Permitting is an intimidating process to an owner builder's very first build, but like finding your subcontractors, this process is nothing to be afraid of. The permitting process and also the permitting price varies from location to location, but the typical process is to walk into the local building department's permitting office carrying your set of building plans in one hand and your checkbook in the other hand. Next, you just sign some papers and pay for the permit. Of course, there's a little bit more to it than what I just explained, but the people working in your local building department are the best resource to use to help guide you through the process to obtain your building permit because again, it all varies location to location. Also, if you're building your house in an established subdivision or neighborhood, then you'll likely have to get your building plans, your material samples, and your paint colors approved by the HOA, which stands for Homeowners Association, or the ACC which stands for Architectural Control Committee. But once you have your permit in your hand and you have all of your approvals from the HOA or the ACC, then you're free to finally start your build. But before you get started on this huge project without a game plan in mind, you first need to schedule the entire build using the build schedule sheet that I provide in my course. I like to look at the build itself as a game and this schedule that you fill out will act as your game plan every day, every week, and every month for the build as it happens in real time. At this point, you can complete the full build schedule for every single day of the build from start to finish because all of your subcontractors have already submitted their timeline of completion of their specific part of the build whenever you requested their bid. Just think how organized you have to be to efficiently schedule between 25 to 30 subcontractors, also coordinate several different material deliveries, and also several inspections with the local building department throughout several different parts of the build. Of course, there will be rain delays and also other unpredictable problems will surely arise throughout the period of construction, so your game plan will have to be changed over time. But overall, the more organized you can be with your build schedule, the smoother your build will go for sure. So once you have your build schedule fully filled out and complete, it is now finally time to break ground on your build. Before I get into the actual physical home building construction process, let me say that the construction process of every single house is very different. So how I explain the process may not match how your home build process goes 100%. So with that said, the very first step of the home building process is starting what is called the site prep, which consists of several different steps to start the development of the raw piece of land. One important part of the site prep is ordering the delivery of the porta john and you need to do this prior to having any subcontractors arrive on site to start working so that they will have a place to use the restroom if they need to do so. Also from day one of the site prep, you should start working on providing the utilities to the site, like the electric, the water, and the sewer. So on day one, you should have your electrician set the T-pole or the temporary electric pole, and you should also contact your local electric supply company and request them to come out and make the temporary electric connection. My electric providers typically take three to five business days after I make that request before they'll come out to make the connection that will give us electricity throughout the course of construction. Next, get the water tap and the sewer tap contractors scheduled to provide taps, which will of course provide a tap to connect to for the water supply and then also a tap to connect to for the sewer. This will give contractors water who need water to effectively do their job if someone needs water for drywall or if someone needs water for concrete as well as the water tap and the sewer tap play a very important role in the inspection process for the plumbing the very first step of the actual construction though will likely be installing a culvert into the bar ditch. This culvert will allow water to flow down the drainage ditch even after you build your driveway over the culvert. The next step is you will install a temporary driveway made of crushed concrete. Of course, the main purpose of this temporary driveway is to provide a vehicle access road to the actual job site, but also this temporary driveway will prevent your vehicle and your subcontractor's vehicles and also your subcontractor's machines from tracking mud and dirt back onto the city street which could catch you a hefty fine. Another step to avoid receiving hefty fines is to manage erosion control on your build 
during the heavy rains and flash floods that occurs during the construction period. And in order to do that, you need to install what's called a silt fence on day one. This silt fence is made of a very strong landscape fabric and it gets installed a couple inches into the ground and it goes all the way around the perimeter of your job site. The silt fence prevents any soil or dirt located on your land from washing into the ditch or onto a neighboring property during any heavy rains throughout the period of construction. Next, you will clear the lot by cutting down all of the unwanted trees and also you will clear all of the unwanted underbrush. Pretty much that wraps up all of the site prep. Now the actual fun part of the build starts where you finally get to see some sort of physical transformation. After all the site prep is complete, your dirt contractor will use a bulldozer to scrape the top eight inches of topsoil and grass out from under where the future house will go. This provides a solid dirt base for the new dirt pad to get built up onto. Next, hire a surveyor to stake the building corner offsets. The surveyor will place wooden stakes five feet from every single building corner and the dirt contractor will use these building corner stakes for guidelines when he is building the dirt pad to make sure he is putting the dirt pad in the correct place. The dirt contractor will then build the dirt pad to the required elevation by dumping several loads of a special kind of dirt called select fill, and then he will use a dozer or a skid steer to spread it out and compact it down. Also, the dirt contractor will grade the rest of the lot to ensure proper drainage and water flow direction, and this will keep you from flooding all of your neighbors throughout the rest of the build. And once your dirt pad is finally complete, you can then proceed with the actual foundation. There are several different types of foundations like slab on grade, basement, and crawl spaces. And they all serve different purposes, but ultimately it is up to both you and your architect and engineer to communicate with what type of basement is best for your home. But for this video, we will be using the traditional rebar and concrete slab on grade foundation, which is most common in my part of America, which is Southeast Texas. So after the pad is built, hire the surveyor again, but this time he will stake the actual building corners and he will put an actual nail in the ground directly on top of where the building corners go. Now it is time for the concrete contractor to take over. First, he will install the temporary form boards around the perimeter of the future foundation and this will shape the concrete slab. But make sure to leave one form board open because next, the plumbing contractor will be driving his mini excavator onto the dirt pad to start digging for the underground plumbing. The plumber will install all of the plumbing drain lines that come from your shower drains, your sink drains, and your washing machine. He will run all of those individual lines into one bigger pipe called the main drain line that leads out to the city sewer connection. Also, before you pour in your concrete, the electrician will run his underground electrical wires for the kitchen island. Now the concrete contractor can resume by continuing with what's called the prep work, where he will start by digging the trenches for the footers and for the beams. These trenches are typically about two feet deep and about one foot wide, and later they will get filled with both rebar and concrete to anchor the foundation into the ground, which will prevent structural cracks and damage as the ground moves over time. After the trenches are dug, he will then install a vapor barrier. This is a large tarp-like material that gets installed into the foundation to prevent water from wicking up through the bottom of the concrete slab and into your flooring. Next, he will install all of the steel rebar into the beams and footers, and then he will also install the rebar in a grid pattern on top of the foundation. Now that the prep work is complete, all that you need is the concrete delivery. The concrete gets delivered in big 70,000 pound concrete trucks, and the concrete gets dumped out in liquid form to fill the form boards all the way to the top. After a couple hours of dry time, the crew will use floats, hand trowels, and a power trowel to make the concrete level and smooth. The concrete contractor will then let the slab cure for a couple days, and then he will come back and strip the forms off of the concrete slab, and voila, your concrete slab is complete. After you give the new slab a couple days to cure, then you can proceed with the framing, which is my personal favorite part of the build. The framer will start from the bottom with the bottom plates that get bolted to the foundation, and this will anchor the concrete slab to the rest of the house. So first he will frame the first floor's walls, and then he will frame the stairs, then he will move on to the first floor's ceiling, then the second floor's actual floor, then he will move on to the second story walls, and then the second story ceiling, and then finally the roof framing. 
After the frame gets installed, you should do a job site walkthrough to check and make sure all of the walls are square and also make sure the rough opening sizes for all of the windows and all of the doors are the correct size. That way all of the doors and windows that you order will fit correctly. Here where I build, the framers only build the stick frame part of the house. So next we are going to move on to the siding, the windows, and the exterior doors. Before the siding gets installed, the sider will install the wall sheathing that comes in 4x8 big rectangular panels. These sheathing panels get nailed into the exterior wall and they serve as an air barrier to separate your indoor air of your house from the outdoor air. You have probably seen fully framed houses fall down during windstorms that come through during a period of construction and this is always a a worry for the builder but once the wall sheathing gets put on the house is very strong and this is essentially no longer a worry so the sheathing provides stability and sheer strength to the house and also the sheathing provides a nailable surface for the siding material that you choose next the cider will install a house wrap this material comes in very long rolls and it gets rolled onto the wall sheathing and nailed down with plastic cap nails to act as a secondary layer of defense if any water ever gets behind your siding. Some builders get their house wrapped and then leave it exposed to the elements for weeks or months, but I personally get the siding installed on top of the house wrap immediately. There are all kinds of siding material that you can go with. There is brick, there is stone, there is stucco or metal, or a traditional wood shake, or a cheaper vinyl siding, or the most popular choice in my area is a fiber cement siding that is relatively affordable, has a great fire rating, it is insect resistant, it's rot proof because it's made of cement, and it also requires very low maintenance, and most importantly, it's easy to install, so it's cheaper on the labor side. As the siding gets installed, the same crew will then install all of the windows and also all of the exterior doors throughout the process. Once this part of the build is complete, it's now time to move on to the roof. The very first part of the roof is installing the roof deck. The decking material is usually the exact same material that you use for the wall sheathing. Therefore, the roof deck serves the exact same purposes as all the wall sheathing, which is providing an air barrier, providing sheer strength and stability to the frame of the house, and also providing a nailable surface for the roofing material that you choose to go with. Next, it is time for the roof underlayment. This material is similar to the house wrap that gets installed on the wall sheathing, except this underlayment gets installed onto the roof deck, but it serves the exact same purpose of providing a secondary layer of defense if any water ever gets below the shingles or whatever roof system you install. Now it is time for the actual roof system to get installed, and I'm sure everyone knows the purpose of a roof, which is to protect the home against sunlight, rain, snow, hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, and other weather elements. And once the roof is on, you can finally move on to the interior work of the house. The very first part of the interior work is what's called the mechanical systems rough-in. Mechanical systems of the house are the plumbing system, the electrical system, and the HVAC system, and HVAC just stands for heating, venting, and air condition. And the rough end part of that phrase simply refers to installing all of the mechanical lines and mechanical components of those systems into the walls, ceilings, and attics of your build. It's important to start with the trade that has the largest lines and then move to the trades that have the smallest lines. So first you will start with the HVAC rough end because they have big 12 inch or bigger air ducts that run through the house. Next is the plumbing rough end. The plumber will install all of the drain lines, the water supply lines, the vent pipes in the attic, and the bathtubs in the bathrooms, and the water heater wherever you're getting your water heater installed. Lastly, the electrician will complete the electrical rough in. This is where he will install the electrical panel, all of the wiring for the house, the light mounting brackets, also the mounting boxes for the outlets, and the light switches. It's very easy to remember which trade to start with if you just use common sense. Would it be easier to run a very small electrical wire around a big HVAC duct, or run a big HVAC duct around a electrical wire that's in the way. The clearly correct answer is to run a electrical wire around a HVAC duct that's in the way because uh, electrical wire doesn't need that much space to be able to be ran. If you make the mistake of having the electrician do the rough end first, then you will likely have several unhappy subcontractors because you have just made their installation job much more difficult for no reason, and you may end up with some snipped electrical wires that will have to be repaired by the electrician in the end. There are typically inspections that come along with the rough end process. So once your inspections are all passed, you can then move on to the insulation of your house. 
Insulation in a home serves as a very important barrier to control the transfer of both hot air or cold air between the interior of your house and the exterior environment outside of your house. It helps regulate temperature by minimizing heat loss during the cold months and preventing excessive heat gain during the warmer months. Proper insulation enhances energy efficiency, reduces utility costs, and contributes to a much more comfortable living space inside your house. There are many different insulation methods and material options out there for you to use to insulate your house. The most affordable and most traditional method is installing fiberglass bat insulation into the wall cavities and then installing fiberglass blown in insulation into the attic. If you go with this method, then you can go ahead and insulate all of the walls in your house, but you must wait until one of the very last home building steps when you're near completion before you install the blown in attic insulation on the other hand, the more superior insulating method is installing and expanding spray foam insulation. Spray foam has many more benefits than just insulating, like providing soundproofing, an air barrier that seals all gaps and all the holes in the walls. Also, it has a vapor barrier, and depending on which type of spray foam you go with, it can provide structural benefits as well. There's an affordable option called open cell spray foam, and then there's a more expensive option that provides many more benefits and a higher efficiency called closed cell spray foam. If you decide to go with the spray foam insulation option, then you can go ahead and insulate the entire house at this point. And for an additional insulating measure, you can also install a reflective insulation. This is typically used in attics and reflective insulation reflects radiant heat and helps keep the space cool. It often consists of a reflective foil material that can be installed either on the top of the roof deck or on the underside of the roof rafters. Also, you can take extra insulating measures by installing rigid foam boards onto the exterior wall sheathing and onto your roof deck. This will provide both structural and insulating benefits. And now with the insulation trade complete, it's time to move on to drywall. Drywall serves as a fundamental building material on the inside of homes, providing a smooth and uniform surface for both interior walls and ceilings. Beyond its structural role, drywall offers fire resistance, contributing to safety by slowing down the spread of fire. Additionally, it facilitates sound insulation, supports various finishes, and allows for the cost-effective and efficient construction of the interior of your home build. The drywall installation and finishing process has three main parts and can be a rather lengthy process. The drywall crew will start by hanging the sheets of drywall. These sheets have a gypsum core on the inside and a paper faced outside and they are four foot wide and they come in lengths of up to eight feet, 10 feet, and 12 foot long. The crew will use a couple of nails to get the piece of drywall tacked onto the wall or ceiling and then they will use a special hammer drill in combination with drywall screws to fully fasten the sheet to the wall or ceiling. Most drywall crews will use stilts to be able to easily reach the tall ceilings. After all the drywall is hung, the next step of the process is referred to as mudding or tape and floating. And this is where the crew will install all of the corner beads to provide a structural protector to the corners of the drywall. And then they will use a drywall mud material to float all of the corner beads, all of the screw holes, and all of the seams. Also, the crew will install a wet tape onto the seams. The crew will let the first layer of mud dry, and then they will come back and apply a second coat of mud. Depending on your desired decorative drywall finish, the crew may need to apply three to five mud layers. The last step of this process is to sand the drywall down to make it very smooth, and then apply the decorative finish. After the drywall trade is complete, it's now time to move on to the finishing parts of the build, and every builder may handle the sequence for these finishes differently, but here is how I handle the order for the finishes. The very first trade that I start with is the flooring. Everyone knows what flooring is and the purpose of flooring, so I'm not gonna get into the specifics there, but after all the flooring is installed, the contractor tapes down a thick protective paper that will prevent any damage throughout the rest of the build. Next, I move on to the carpentry trade. Carpentry consists of all the woodwork, like the kitchen cabinets, the bathroom vanities, the baseboards, the interior doors, and all of the shelving. Now that the cabinetry is installed, I have the countertop contractor install the countertops in the kitchen and in the bathrooms. Then I schedule the painter to paint both the interior and the exterior of the house. Lastly, I schedule the HVAC contractor, the plumber, and the electrician to complete the mechanical trim out. The HVAC contractor will install the condenser unit, 
the sealing grates, and the thermostat. The plumber will install the sink faucets, the garbage disposal, the shower trim, and all of the toilets. The electrician will install the can lights, the light switches and light plates, the outlets and the outlet plate covers, and any other special lights that go on the house. Once the electrician is finished, call your electrical provider and request for them to come disconnect the temporary service from the temporary pole and also to make the permanent connection to the house. There are only three items left to complete on your home build, and that is the concrete flat work, a fence if you need a fence, and the landscape. The first part of the exterior finishes is the concrete flat work, and this includes all non-structural concrete work like sidewalks, patios, stairs, driveways, and the AC pad. Next, install any fences that you have on your home build, and this will avoid damaging the finished landscape. And then lastly, I finish the house with the landscape, and that consists of the final grade, adding topsoil, installing the flower beds or rock beds, installing the plants, and finally laying the grass sod. Now, your home build is fully complete. A final punch typically refers to a final inspection or a final walkthrough of a newly constructed home before it is considered complete and ready for occupancy. During this phase, a punch list, which is a list of incomplete or defective items, is created. The final punch involves addressing and rectifying these items to ensure that the construction meets the agreed upon specifications, building codes, and quality standards. It is a very important step in ensuring that your home is safe and functional and meets your expectations as both the builder and the homeowner. So the final step of the entire process is for you to complete your final walkthrough inspection using the final punch list that I provide in my course. During this walkthrough, you will do things like open and close all of the house doors, the cabinet doors, the cabinet drawers, and appliance doors, open and close all the windows, test all the toilets, the faucets, and the shower heads to test for leaks, turn on the AC system, turn on and test all the appliances, and much more to test functionality and ensure that there are no problems with your home build. This is one of the most important steps for you, the builder, because this is your very last chance to hold your subcontractors accountable one last time and get all the repairs made before you accept your subcontractor's work pay the final invoices, and then, of course, move into your home. There's so much more to building a house than what I just went over in this one hour long YouTube video. So if you're seriously considering building your own house, whether that be for a rental property or a spec home that you wanna to build to sell or your custom dream house, then right now you should click the link in my description and go check out my course because I promise you, it will prepare you for every single step of the process and it will save you tens of thousands of dollars from having to hire a builder or a general contractor whenever you have what it takes to build your own house. So hit the subscribe button and the bell below to get notified whenever I upload my next videos because I have a huge project that I'm preparing for and you do not want to miss out on those future videos. Also hit the like button and leave me a comment to tell me what questions you may have about building your own house. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Click here to watch another video.